voudrais évidemment tout d'abord vous remercier d'être venu euh, tout de même relativement nombreux. Euh, donc après une journée de cours peut-être bien chargée pour certains, euh, notamment pour les étudiants et aussi pour euh, les collègues. Euh, J'adresse d'abord, avant d'oublier, <rire> mes remerciements les plus chaleureux à, à tous ceux dont la générosité nous a permis d'organiser cette manifestation, à savoir l'Université de Bordeaux 3, bien sûr, euh, par le titre de son service culturel, euh, et également l'UFR Langue et Civilisation, ici représenté par son directeur, M. Joël Richard, que je remercie donc encore une fois. Voilà. Euh, et je m'excuse par avance auprès de mes collègues hispanistes, il y en a peut-être quelques-uns ici, je crois que Sabine est encore là, euh, pour mon piètre accent espagnol, euh, que mes étudiants de master doivent supporter quand même depuis quelques semaines avec beaucoup de stoïcisme, je dois dire. Euh, mais c'est vrai que mon espagnol n'est plus qu'un lointain souvenir. Hein. J'avais fait quelques années au collège, au lycée, mais j'ai très très vite oublié. Tout ça. Bon, de toute façon, rassurez-vous, à part quelques titres en espagnol, euh, je présenterai Carmen Tafoli en français. Euh, J'ai pensé qu'effectivement, c'était le mieux pour être comprise, j'espère, de la plupart d'entre vous, euh, puisque certains peut-être ne parlent pas euh, forcément suffisamment bien anglais pour suivre. Euh, donc voilà, c'est un, un honneur en tout cas pour nous aujourd'hui de recevoir Madame Carmen Tafolia, dont la liste des distinctions honorifiques est tellement longue que j'ai dû me préparer un, un petit pense bête, et encore, je ne vais pas vous parler de tout. Hein. Euh, alors, je commencerai d'abord par quelques titres qui l'ont rendu célèbre, dont euh, le fameux Curandera. Alors, vous avez quelques livres ici. Voilà, donc le premier, euh, un recueil de poésie bilingue publié en fait en 1983, mais qui lui a récemment valu d'être censuré donc, par les instances éducatives de l'État d'Arizona, au même titre qu'une trentaine d'autres ouvrages dont on considère apparemment qu'ils portent atteinte aux valeurs démocratiques américaines. Euh, ceci dit, elle est en bonne compagnie au banc des accusés, puisque la tempête de Shakespeare euh, a également n'a plus droit de citer non plus dans ces mêmes écoles. Donc euh, voilà, c'est quand même un bon signe. Euh, alors, donc, elle a, allez savoir pourquoi elle avait reçu également en 1999 le prix Art of Peace, qui récompense les artistes qui œuvrent au service de la paix et de l'entente entre les hommes. Les voix de la logique américaine sont parfois impénétrables, je dois dire. Euh, depuis ce premier recueil, donc, Carmen de Folia en a publié bien d'autres. Ah, I'm sorry. Madame, oui. vous savez où est le camion pour, pour la Caille de Guadeloupe euh, Non, désolé, il faut demander à l'accueil. D'accord Il y a votre accueil. Donc, euh, je disais, oui, donc Carmen Tafoli a publié bien d'autres ouvrages, donc La Isabella de Guadeloupe et autres Chucas, en 1984, euh, Sonnets to Human Beings, en 1992, Sonnets and Salsa, donc vous avez également un exemplaire ici. Vous verrez tout à l'heure, donc, euh, en 2001. Et je vous recommande aussi tout particulièrement, par contre, ce petit recueil de nouvelles, euh, absolument superbe, donc The Holy Tortilla and the Pot of Beans, que mes étudiants de master donc, étudient depuis quelques semaines et qu'ils connaissent bien. <rire> voilà. Euh, et donc, je, euh, autre chose aussi, Carmen Tafoli a plus d'une corde à son arc, puisque... Dans les années 70, déjà, elle a travaillé en tant que scénariste pour un programme télévisé bilingue destiné aux enfants. Et c'est ce qui l'a peut-être mené d'ailleurs plus récemment à écrire des ouvrages destinés à un jeune public. Euh, il n'y en a qu'un seul exemplaire ici que je vais m'empresser d'acheter pour mes enfants, donc vous ne pourrez pas le prendre, désolé. <rire> elle aurait dû en apporter davantage. Euh, mais ces ouvrages bilingues pour enfants ont été maintes fois récompensés, euh, notamment donc « What can you do with the Paletta ?» qui a reçu trois distinctions en 2010, le prix Américas, le prix Tro Thomas Rivera et surtout le prix Charlotte Zolotov qui récompense le meilleur livre illustré pour enfants et qui n'avait apparemment jamais auparavant été décerné à un auteur latino. Et plus récemment, un autre ouvrage « Fiesta Babies » a également été sélectionné comme un des meilleurs livres pour enfants de l'année 2011. Et mention spéciale également pour un autre livre qui lui tient particulièrement à cœur, uh, « That's not fair, Emma Tenayuka's struggle for justice » ou « No es justo, la lucha de Emma Tenayuka pour la justicia euh, » qui, qui a été donc euh, reconnu comme un des meilleurs livres pour enfants de l'année 2008 et dans lequel elle raconte en fait le combat euh, que mena une figure méconnue de la lutte ouvrière au Texas, donc Emma Tenayuka. Et enfin, en avril 2012, elle a reçu le titre de premier poète officiel de la ville de San Antonio, sa ville natale, donc au Texas. Et ce sont précisément donc les voix riches et bigarrées 
euh, des habitants de San Antonio qui l'ont inspiré de ce One Woman Show donc qu'elle va nous présenter ce soir. Euh, sans plus attendre, donc, euh, je vous laisse découvrir, la, enfin, faire connaissance avec ce, ce San Antonio aux multiples facettes. Voilà. I don't go to doctor no more. I went one time, and you know what they do to me? They put me in this room. They call it a waiting room. Do you know what you do there? You wait and you wait and you wait, and by the time they call me, I was almost well already. <laughs> I don't go to doctor no more. Yo me voy a sentar aquí. Because si alguien tiene un carro, coche, you know, go car like that, they take me to my home in La Calle Guadalupe. Because you people going to wait so long for the doctor. You see how many people there are here waiting? <laughs> oh, by the time they call me la nurse, la enfermera, she takes me to another room. And you know what she said to me there? She said, take off your clothes. Así me lo dice que yo tengo que take off your clothes. Take off your clothes and put on this gown. It was not a gown. It was a piece of paper on papel. Oh my God. <laughs> and it was cold in that piece of paper. And I wait and I wait and I wait some more. And by the time the doctor come, I was sick all over again. <laughs> no. I go to Corandera. You know, the good kind. Not the bad kind. Mm. The bad kind charge money. Mm. The good kind don't charge nothing. They take uh, little leaves, they make tea, you boil, they give you the leaves. You boil, you drink tea, you get well. Mm -hmm. The doctor don't give you nothing, they charge money. Mm -hmm. And then, after you pay the money, they give you a little piece of paper. Estos gringos con papelitos. Todo es papelito. They have to be a little piece of paper. And take that little piece of paper, you go another place, La Botica, <laughs> where they give you, not give, charge with money, a little bottle of pills, little tiny pills that are made from the same leaves that Gurandera will give you for free. <laughs> I don't. You wait for doctor, you get bored, bored, bored. Better. We sing, we dance, somebody forget about doctor, get well, we all go in el carrito. I have tamalitos at my house, no, salsa, no. lo que tu quieras, eh? <laughs> eh mira, eh, I don't have to sing, I sing just like a radio, mira. Ay. Todos dicen que la banda está borracha, está borracha, está, you don't know the song? I know another. It's a folk song about a little girl named Margarita or Macarena or something like that, I forget. Mm -hmm. No, I know another. It's stop in the name of love <laughs> before you break my heart. Think it over, think it over. <laughs> that was my Tia Sofia, my Aunt Sophie. And my Aunt Sophie was weird, even in my family. My family was weird enough already. But Tia Sofia, she was even weird for my family. Mm -hmm. She was different. She was out of the box. She didn't fit the stereotypes. But then, how many of us fit the stereotypes? Mm -hmm. How many of us fit inside the boxes? You know the boxes, the ones you have to fill out at the beginnings of forms, the ones that say white, not Hispanic, black, not Hispanic, Hispanic, not Hispanic, you know. <laughs> we don't fit because we're different. Each one of us a little unique, a little bit weird, just like Tia Sofia. Tia Sofia was plenty weird. Tia Sofia wasn't like my other aunts. My other aunts were a little more like what you expect an elderly Hispanic woman to be like, but Tia Sofia, oh, she played the latest Motown hits <laughs> and owned a record shop records, vinyls, you know, <laughs> up on the wall, 33s, 45s, 78s, all across her wall. 
smiling, cool, pachuco, young, sunny, and the sanglos. Flaco Jimenez, Toby Torres, the Latin breed, the royal jesters also, little Stevie Wonder, and the Supremes. And she would sing to pass the time. She would sing, I found my trial on blueberry hill. <laughs> she also liked lavender blue. It seemed to be her color, but in a bright flowered cotton print from Solo Sir. Oh, uh, you don't know Solo Sir? Yes, I do. Do you know Police or Macy's? Do you know the Everything Under a Dollar Store? Mm -hmm. Solo Sir made the Everything Under a Dollar mm -hmm. Store look like Foley's <laughs> <laughs> or Marshall Fields. Because at Solo Sir, you could get everything 20 for a dollar, and she did. She would carry her dos bolsotas de la casa. <laughs> Iba directamente a Solo Sir, venía con todas las gangas y las bolsotas y notas. And she would say to her younger sister, cuatro yardas de floral print cottons por solo 89 cents. Fíjate no más, Sarah, you never get that price anywhere else. <laughs> she would say to her younger sister, and she was right. We never got it at that price anywhere else. She was right about a lot of things she got criticized for. She was right about mixing her English and her Spanish, only she mixed it again with black English and all the latest slang. And they would say, I, Sophia, when you speak English, you should make it a correct English, Sophia. Mm -hmm. And when you speak Spanish, debe ser un español correcto. No es la cosa como los teenagers de Tex-Mex. <laughs> but Tia Sofia spoke it all. She mixed it all together. She sang her hits. She was so non-standard, the family was so embarrassed. They were especially embarrassed about the fact that my other aunts were all in church, always in church, all of them in church, Anita, Sara, Fede, y Sofia? would say, well, on Sunday mornings, mm -hmm. I played Tennessee Ernie Ford's greatest hymns mm -hmm. at the record shop. And she did, and she sang along, never learning that only singing in church counted. Mm -hmm. She never made it through school either. Instead of Sophia, instead of ethnic jokes, my family told Sophia jokes. Oh. They did. They said things like, oh, remember that time at the lake on Sophia? Oh, see. Sí. Hey, Sophie. Come out of the water, it's raining. No, porque me mojo. I'll get wet. They were always a little embarrassed by her lack of wisdom and her lack of piety. And after she died, they didn't know what to say. Didn't feel quite right saying she's always been a good Christian, so they praised the way. Siempre se arreglaba la cara, yeah. She would fix her face up with mascara and colorete blush. And she would dye her hair sometimes black, sometimes red, whatever. Pero, pero she took good care of her face. And they couldn't think of anything else nice to say no. at the funeral <laughs> until somebody said, Well, and she never fooled around, even though she could have after Uncle Raymond died, when she was still young, only 71. <laughs> Her funeral comes every two years in my family now, just like the births did 70 to 90 years ago. And I remember a picture of a young flapper with large eyes. It was Tia Sophia. Between the tears, we bump into the coffin by accident and get scared and start laughing. And it seems and it also seems appropriate to sing in a black text mix. Blueberry Hial. <laughs> Tia Sofia was only one of many voices I'd like to share with you tonight. Voices that come from my barrio, my neighborhood, my text mix mixed up Spanish, English, two cultures, two languages, two sets of human beings, neighborhood. Because That neighborhood comes from your neighborhood. It comes from our world, which is a very, very small planet. And there's nothing that happens on one side of the planet that doesn't happen all the way around on the other side as well. You know, we all influence each other. We think not, 
We think our lives are totally independent. What I do has nothing to do with anybody else. But the truth of the matter is that our lives are like little pebbles dropped in the middle of a lake. And as the ripples go out and out and out, they get to the edge and some leaf gets its entire life turns upside down because of our little pebble in the center of the lake. So everything we do, every smile, every interaction, every acceptance or rejection influences everyone. So I think that everybody's voice has something to do with our neighborhoods and our homes. So I share these voices throughout the world. And I'd like to share one of a very young child. On her very first day of first grade, her name is Tere. It's short for Teresa. Teresa was named for her tia Teresa, her aunt, and her grandma Teresa, and her grandma's grandma Teresa, and her grandma's grandma's grandma. <laughs> she goes to school like most young children, very proud of what she knows, thinking she's very smart, and feeling that she has a lot that she's going to accomplish. But like a lot of children who differ because they're part of a linguistic or a cultural minority, when they get to the school system, sometimes they find that they don't match. They don't match the little boxes. They don't match the stereotypes. They don't match what the school is expecting. They don't match the characters in the textbooks. And so, Tere, like a lot of kids, comes back from her first day in first grade not thinking she's as smart or as acceptable or as lovable or as capable or even that she belongs. I have performed Tere a lot of places. And I'm never surprised when I perform her in Los Angeles or Chicago or Tucson, Phoenix, Dallas, the Rio Grande Valley, San Antonio or El Paso. And some young Mexican-American girl invariably comes up to me after the performance and says, that was me. I was there. But then I performed her in the north of Canada. There wasn't a single Mexican-American in the audience. And I had been thinking that that was a pretty good portrayal of what it was like to be Mexican-American and female. And in the north of Canada, with one Native Canadian, one Native American Canadian, one Indigenous Canadian, sitting in the front row, and no Mexican-Americans and no Latinos, I performed her, and a young Latvian woman came up to me after the performance and said, that was me. I was there. And I always do my performances bilingually because I can't do these characters in one language. They live between languages. They live between cultures. One language doesn't capture it. It doesn't tell the entirety of their lives. So if I speak to an English-speaking audience, I make it mainly in English with a little Spanish sprinkled in. And if I speak to a Spanish-speaking audience, I make it mainly Spanish with a little English sprinkled in. And then if it's someplace else, I kind of have to gauge what their strongest languages are and kind of go from there. So I performed it in the north of Spain, primarily in Spanish thinking, they're not going to get it. They don't know about being minorities. They're Spaniards in Spain. They're first class citizens. They don't understand what, what it is to be at the bottom or what Spanish means in certain parts of the United States. So I performed it anyway. And a young Basque woman came up to me afterwards and she said, Esa fui yo, yo fui Tere. <laughs> so I said, OK, so maybe that is a pretty good portrayal of what it's like to be female and from a linguistic minority, a language, a cultural minority. And then I performed it in Norway. And a young Norwegian man came up to me after the performance and said, that was me. I was Tere. And I thought, maybe that is the voice of all of us anytime we don't fit inside those little boxes that society has all set out for us. 
So the boy said there on her first day of first grade. Se ve pretty. Me quiero ver pretty para la t-shirt. I got first grade today. Okay, Mama. Do let me finish the cartoons first. <laughs> okay, Mama. Hi, boy. Bye, Mama. Yes, I'll go straight to first grade. Yes, Mama. And I no speak to nobody on the way. Yes, Mama. And I no talk to strangers. Mama. Was a stranger. <laughs> well, then I no talk to nobody. Ama, you don't got to go with me. You stay home as a baby. I know how to get there. We went on the registration. Yeah, I can do it, Ama. You don't got to worry. I no talk to strangers. I no talk to nobody. I no get lost. No, ma, it's only a block away. <laughs> yes, Ama. Yes, Ama, I be go to the t-shirt. I respect her, I do everything she say. I know, okay, Mexico, where you come from, the three highest things is God, La Virgen de Guadalupe, <laughs> and La Maestra, the t-shirt. <laughs> I be good to her, Ma. Yes, I respect, I say please and thank you. No me limpio los mocos en frente a ella. <laughs> yeah, Ma. Yeah, yeah. I, I go, and, and I look at lost. Ma, I'm almost there already. Yeah. Yeah, yes, I'm a, okay, okay, bye, bye, okay, I go. Hey, I go to first grade? You don't know, because you're too little. You mm -hmm. gotta stay home. I big, I get to go, are you a stranger? No? Good. I didn't think so. You live here? Oh, good. Good. I, I, I come back from first grade. I tell you all about it. But first I got to go because because I don't want to be late. Because I want to teach her to love me. Because she's going to love me because I'm pretty. Um, mm -hmm. Because i smart. Because i smart. You know, my grandma, she say so. She say, Más viva que una víbora esta muchacha. Which means smarter than a snake. Mm -hmm. and, and, and because I know we late to school. So I got to go to school. So I go, but you're too little. You got to stay home. You can't go. I'll tell you about it after, okay? Because you're too little. <laughs> I went, I went to first grade, and I was fun, and there were lots of kids, and there was, there was a um, teacher, she was pretty like teacher, oh, she was so pretty, and there were chalkboard, and chalk too, yeah, and there were desks, and our books, big books like that. And that teacher, she come up to me and she say, hi, my name is Miss Jones. Mm -hmm. I say, hi, my name is Tere. And she say, oh, Terry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, it's Tere. Mm -hmm. No, it's pronounced Terry. <laughs> <laughs> That's pronounced Tere. Watch my mouth. <laughs> Terry. Terry. See? No, I said it. <laughs> Look, it's easy. Terry. Terry. See? No, I said it. <laughs> Terry. Terry. 
Tere. Terry. Terry. Yes, you got it. Tere. Terry. Ok, ok, it's three. <laughs> Pero, no importa. No importa. It doesn't matter. Because then the teacher, she says something uh, uh, about us going to watch a movie. Because she, she said she had too many papers to fill out, so she fill out the papers to watch a movie. So she let us watch a movie. It was so cool. It was called La Cinderella. And La Cinderella, she was smart, she was pretty, she was everything. I love that movie. It was so cool. I love the movie. And when the movie was over, they give you pictures to color, and they give you the colors. Then they take them away, but first they give them to you. So, <laughs> so I color mine so pretty. She have little blue stairs on the eye like my big sister does. She have long black hair down to there like my big sister does. She looked just like my big sister. No más que mi big sister se pone glitter también, but they don't have a glitter color. So <laughs> this is the blue. But she was so pretty. The teacher come up and she says, oh no, Cinderella has blonde hair. Mine has black. No, Cinderella has blonde hair. I'll take this away and you can do another one. Do it right. Do it pretty, okay? Did she take away my pretty picture, La Cinderella, the one with the long black hair down to there and the little blue stuff? See, I even look like my dead sister without the glitter. Pero, no importa. No importa. It doesn't matter. Because then, then, Teacher says she's gonna teach us stuff. And I say, teacher, teacher, I know how to write my name, teacher. I know how to write my name. And she said, that's nice, now sit down. Teacher, I can write my name, teacher. I know how to write my name. That's nice, now sit down. Teacher, I can write my name, teacher. I know how to write my name. That's nice, now sit down. So she teaches stuff like how to sit down, <laughs> how to raise your hand and lower your hand, and how the boys go one line and the girls go another, but no importa. No importa, it doesn't matter because then, then you could smell the food coming from the cafeteria. And I was hungry before lunch. I would go to the cafeteria because los boys in one line, girls in another. And we go to the cafeteria, hay mucha comida. They have so much food that they give you these big plates they call trays. Eh? And you take your tray and you're gonna go get the food and you get up to the front. And this lady dressed all in white like a doctor's office. She said, three things. You put three things in your tray. She scared me. So I grabbed peas and prunes and casamo like that because she scared me. And I don't like prunes. And I don't like peas. No, like casamo, but she scared me. So I got there fast. I was hungry after lunch, pero no importa. No importa, it doesn't matter because then we got to go to E.T. Yeah, no, T.E. No, T.E. Eso, eso, P.E. We got to go to P.E. And you get your own coach, like in the Olympics. <laughs> and I said, hey, coach, you're my coach, coach. I never coach before, coach. I do whatever you want, coach. I run, I jump, I do the flipping flop. It's like in the game, you want me to coach, because I'm, you're my coach, coach. I never coach before. I do whatever you want, coach. Okay, coach. And the coach, he say, he say, now, wait a minute. We're going to run races first. <gasps> coach, pick me, pick me. I run race fast. I run races fast, coach. I want to run for you, coach, because you're my coach. I never coach before, coach. I want to do what you want me to do. Okay, coach. So you let me run racing. He said, now, wait a minute. We're going to let these boys over here go first, show us how to do it. Con que Juanito y Charlie were going to show us how to do it. You know Juanito? He lives down the block. He, he's nice to me. Sometimes he lets me have a lollipop when he's not finished with it and stuff like that. <laughs> he don't run as fast as I do, but the coach don't know that. So I want to be nice to Juanito. So they're running the race. So I say, Correle, Juanito! The teacher in the morning said we're not supposed to speak Spanish. I forgot. I just wanted to run. I wanted to feel good. So the coach, he come up to me and he say, this is the U.S. Speak English. Yes, coach. Yes, coach. Uh, run. Johnny, 
Pero no importa. No importa, it doesn't matter because then we got to go back to the class. And the teacher said she could have teach us how to write our names. And I said, teacher, teacher, I know how to write my name. And the teacher, she said, I don't know how to write my name. She said, I put it all in something called capitums. <laughs> she said it's supposed to be one capitum and the other's little. So I have it on my paper, it says Tere. D and an E and I forget what call like that and another E and it was on my paper and it said Tere and she come up and she raised my name and she say do it over do it right but it was disappear it was like invisible it no importa, no importa, it doesn't matter. Because then at the end of the day, they play the game, they say, they talk in the cabeza, if they talk in the cabeza, to rinca para arriba, you say, hi, I'm going to try that one like that, you know that one? And so when they touch me at the head, I jump up, I say, hi, I did it. And the teacher, she say, Terry. And I say, oh yeah, I forgot, <laughs> Terry. <laughs> but then the teacher, she mumbles something about putting me in the slow class. I don't want to go with the slow class and move around slow <laughs> and long. I want to run and jump with everyone else. Yeah. I got first grade again tomorrow. Pero, no importa. Some have a strong sense of identity. Those are the kids we usually call the troublemakers. The next voice you hear belongs to a kid they call a lot of things. Chola, pachuca, hood, a bad kid, a probable dropout. And yet, there's a secret about her that many of the teachers don't know. And that is that never once in her entire school career has she seen her name in an assignment, in a book, in a film, even on a test. Her name does not exist among the characters that go to school. Her name is a traditional Mexican name, but she calls it a stupid Mexican name that the teachers can't say right. Because instead of the beautiful Araceli, they say air seal and Arceli and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so she decides to take on a moniker, her own name, something more English. She calls herself La Dot. Mm -hmm. It has an icon. She can spray paint it on a dumpster or on a school wall in 10 seconds. La Dot. So all her friends know her as La Dot. Only she knows that she's never seen an Araceli in the educational materials. It hurts when you look in the mirror and you don't see yourself. It hurts when you don't see your culture or your language or your features or your family reflected in material that's supposed to reflect the children of the classroom. So this is a little glimpse of Araceli in the library at a crucial fork in the road in her life. And I ask you to uh, bear with me because she's a pretty ill-spoken person. <laughs> but all of her dirty words are in Spanish, so it's okay. Uh, we don't have to worry about any, any obscenities in English here. Uh, she's rough and she's tough. And yet we find her at that moment when her life is about to change. Araceli in the library. I'm telling you, I'm not going to do a book report just because the teacher says, 
just because the teacher think that we're gonna do a book report because she take us to the library, tontos los books, tonta la teacher, tonta la library. I'm not gonna do nothing like that. I'm not, I'm gonna go have fun. Yeah, and you know what? I'll tell you how to have fun with me. You see that side door over there? i tell you what to do. You find a book on color escandaloso, loud color, you know, like red or purple, something like that. When you find it, you make sure the teacher see you reading it. The minute she see you reading it, she make a check mark on her list. Today is not for uh, note cards, the outline, and toda la pendejada eso. Today is just for find a book. So when she see you find the book, she make the check mark. She forget all about it. She go to the next kid to see if they find the book. So you make sure she see you find the book. Oh, you love the book? She make a check mark. I meet you outside the side door. Nos arrancamos. We'll take off. We'll go to the Valero station. You know, we'll buy a, a Coke. Maybe nos venden cigarros. I look 18 sometimes. Yeah. And, and um, we can do a lot of stuff. We can watch the guys get passing in sus low riders. Hijo, también cooles, vatos. We can do a lot of stuff. And then we'll be back before the bell and rings. The teacher won't even know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you give me like 30 seconds, okay, girl? But remember, color escandaloso, loud color on the cover of the book. That way she see you fast. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. give me 30 seconds, I'll meet you right outside. Okay, mm -hmm. what you got here? White, black, beige. Ain't you got any good books in this library? <laughs> Pale blue, híjole. <laughs> this will work. This is red. Yeah, she like it, she like it. Okay, teacher, I got my book. Oh, look at me, teacher, I got my teacher. Teacher, look this way. Mm -hmm. Teacher, look this way. <laughs> Come on, I ain't got all day. <laughs> Quit talking to a librarian, he's not even cute. <laughs> Come on, teacher, Chella's waiting for me. Oh, I love this. Teacher. Come on, pay attention, I'm your student like. Mm -hmm. Come on, teacher. She's gonna think I'm stupid that I can't find a color escandaloso after I told her how to do it. Come on. So what's the name of the stupid girl getting? Araceli's question. This book is called Araceli's question. It can't be Araceli's question. I don't know who called Araceli's question. My name not a book type name. My name is a stupid name. It don't show in books. No, it, it, it gotta be a typo. That's what it is. It's a typo. There's no book called Araceli's question like that. No, it can't be. It can't. Araceli studied the things in her life which brought her pain, a sticking sense of emptiness inside a wondering why she was here, a hunger to be active, not to stupidly sit and be nothing, not to watch the life go boringly by like a car full of party people that was going somewhere she would not be going. Silly. This book has my name. My, my name, not a book type name. It's gotta be typo, gotta be. So, Araceli remembered her Saturday nights, her barrio full of life, the smell of toasted cebollas and chile jalapeño on the steaming comal, the sound of Don Chencho's beautiful guitar and Tomasi's boombox. On Saturday nights, her barrio was full of life, but on Monday mornings, Araceli's barrio was dull, sitting at the desk in one class, then a desk in another class, then a desk in another class that didn't speak her language, didn't see her face, didn't call her name. <gasps> oh, shall I see? Araceli knew that. What? Eh, whatever. <laughs> what, Chela? Oh, que the Valero station. Um. Uh, Forget the stupid Valero station and the boring coke and the boring guys that passed by yesterday, bored and passed by bored again today. Leave me alone and busy. I silly knew that. What? 
Busy with what? Well, I'm just busy with something important. Yeah, so leave me alone. But a silly knew that was so important. I'm reading. I'm reading a book. Yeah, I'm reading a book, so leave me alone. Araceli knew that she wanted to do something with her life. She just didn't know what or how. Araceli finds her own way to relevance in education. Araceli finds that there is literature that reflects her experiences. But Araceli is one among thousands, tens of thousands, who never see themselves in the books around them. So many voices around us, each unique, and each with something important to tell us. The next voice you'll hear belongs to a woman who doesn't have a fancy job title. She doesn't have a great deal of education. She doesn't have any money in the bank. But she's a very wise woman because she knows who she is and where she comes from, what her culture is. And she will make use, like so many of our elderly women and the families, of whatever language and whatever culture comes across to help her family survive. She lives in a society in the United States that is very instant oriented. We want everything fast, maybe faster. Mm -hmm. If something takes 15 seconds to warm in the microwave, we have to figure out something to do in that 15 seconds. <laughs> this, um, this woman, it's not instant. She has taken generations to be formed. And her name, her name isn't instant either. We come in a society that likes fast names. If you name your child Gabriela Maria, they're gonna call her Gabby for short. If you name your child Micaela Annalisa, they're gonna call her Mickey. If you name your son, Jose Maria Guadalupe, they're gonna call him Jack. <laughs> but the next voice you'll hear belongs to a woman who calls herself Senora Maria Francisca Baca Gonzalez Montoya de Lucan. And that's all I'm gonna say about her. <laughs> Hello, what you want? Survey? Oh, sure. Oh. I got the survey. You take a Let me turn off the beans first, so that they don't get burned. Esa gente que siempre viene a la hora de la comida. No sé por qué sería. Porque no comen, o porque no trabajan. Quién sabe. Okay, mijita. What you want to know? Name? Oh, sí. Yo tengo name. My name is Maria Francisca Vaca Gonzalez Montoya de Lucan para servirle. What? You want to know which is last name? Todos, <laughs> mijita, <laughs> all of them are last name. Vaca, that was my father. Gonzalez, that was my mother. Montoya era mi gramo. Era una familia muy importante. Oh, you know, speak Spanish, eh? Uh -huh. Okay, that way no, it was important family. I'm surprised you don't know about the Montoyas. 
El Ohan was my husband, por eso tú puedes concentrar. They don't fit on your line. Pues a ver, let me see. Look, right little and it fit on your line. Little, little, chiquitito, así. María, Francisca, así, keep going. ¿Ves? Así, fit in your line. Ay, mijita. Bueno, pues mira. I show you how to do it because you have to put it in. Vaca, vaca, con de burro. Yes. Now you have to put Gonzalez. You know, put her in, you know, put me in. She, my mother. She, no, here, I know there. You want me in your survey? You have to have her in your survey? No. Yeah. Little, little, escríbelo chiquito. Vaca, Gonzalez, Montoya, porque era una familia muy. I know, I know, you don't speak Spanish. She is an important family. Okay. Elohan, because you have to respect the dead. Okay. Okay, I help you. Bye. Oh, you have more questions? Sure. I'm gonna keep it. H. 91. I'm born. Of course I was born. <laughs> oh, que where? Que born in Mexico, que born in Isleño, aquí, aquí, pero los Estados Unidos, United States. Excited States, United States. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was born here. How long family lived here? Three? No, no, three years. 300 years, mijita. We were here. My family didn't cross the border. My parents didn't cross the border. My grandparents didn't cross the border. The border crossed us. We were here already. <laughs> It is it the, no no to think like foreigner then no foreigner planet is round it don't got on corners and sides it all mixed together yeah uh, yeah uh, I, I have more questions sure under the like, okay. occupation okay, what do I do <laughs> I raise six children. 20 grandchildren, a whole bunch of great grandchildren también. Y las cosas de la casa, la lavada, la limpiada. No, you don't speak Spanish. I, I work, I work house stuffs, house things, todo, todo eso. Um, how you say, uh, uh, the, the things of the house, and I do la pizca, pero no sé cómo decirlo en inglés. And I, um, I do many, many, many things. Con que le pongas, you put a, House stuffs, house works, eso, house things, eso, mm -hmm. sí, it's my occupation, eh? Good, good, I'm glad I helped you, I'm glad, wait, 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 what, what you put there? Como que, occupation none, <laughs> occupation none, no señorita, está wrong, 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 how you can put that there? It's wrong, it's very wrong. How you can put occupation on? I go to the five in the morning, every morning of my life, sometimes early, I came over to Chile, I have to tortillas, and I know, I know, you know, speak Spanish. Um, I feed, I feed the men, I feed the women, I feed the children, I feed the friends, I feed the enemies, I feed everybody. Señorita, que occupation on que nada. Y también las cosas de la casa, the things of the house. The things of the house, they no finish. They never finish. They go and they go and they go. You do, you clean, you cook. It goes and goes, it don't stop. I, 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 I never retired, mijita. Someday I die, but I never retired. Yeah. <laughs> no? Uh, and después también, uh, eso de, de, de la pizca, la pizca. You see these pockets all bent over. It's for la pizca, but I don't know how to say in English. La pizca is the peak. Is the peak. You know, you pick potato, you pick squash, you pick melon, you pick lechuga, you pick beets, todo lo que comes tú. You eat it, I picked it. No, señorita, que occupation, and que nada. There was a occupation, and quítaselo. Quítaselo y res it. And put it over here. Where say, salary. Salary, none. Occupation, mucho. <laughs> remaining 
but there are thousands of voices. Voices all around us that have something to tell us about the value of being human, about the value of being unique, different, in between. We're all in between, whether it's between cultures or between languages, between emotions, between majors, between points in our lives. We're all between. The next voice you'll hear belongs to a young woman who's criticized a lot because, well, let me just say, her name is Heather Garcia. And while many people criticize her, I consider her a very brave young woman. So very quickly, the voice of Heather Garcia. Hi, glad to meet you. I'm Heather, Heather Garcia. Yeah, Garcia. What? I'm sorry, I don't understand you. I, I don't speak Spanish. <laughs> no, no, no me estoy haciendo. I, I really don't speak Spanish. I mean, except for a word or two that my grandma Speranza taught me. Esperanza. Esperanza. I can't even say her name right. Mm -hmm. Esperanza. But I don't speak Spanish. I mean, my parents didn't teach it to me. I mean, like, I would like to speak Spanish, but I don't know it. No, I'm not trying to be a snob. I don't understand <laughs> you. You see, my mother and father didn't teach it to me because when my mother was little and in school, it was against the state law in Texas mm -hmm. and Arizona and California and New Mexico and Colorado. Mm -hmm. And schools would punish young children for speaking Spanish. I mean, you could say, hi, teacher, I love you. And you would get paddled on the rear end or slapped on the hand. One for every word in Spanish. And if the teacher didn't speak Spanish and you said, te quiero mucho, she might think that sounded like 10 words. So get <laughs> <laughs> you know? um, And my mom, when she started school, she got punished. Like, she asked if she could go to the bathroom. And the teacher made her stand with her nose inside a circle on the blackboard all during recess. And, was really painful and she didn't get to go to the restroom either and it was really rough and so she decided not to teach me any and my dad well my dad was put like in a special education class like a class for the retarded you know because the teacher said he didn't understand anything well in English so I guess they didn't want me to have those kinds of things happen, so they never taught me Spanish. Yeah, I know, they could have taught me both languages, but they were doing what they thought was best. And so I don't speak any Spanish, except for a word or two that my grandma Speranza taught me. And I mean, I'm okay, like I don't have any bad memories of going to school punishments or being put in the wrong class or anything like that, but Sometimes I have inside here, I just feel like I lost a language. Sometimes I feel like I 
lost a culture. And sometimes I feel like I have inside here what Graham Speranza calls a Waco. A Waco? No, not like Waco, Texas. <laughs> not French <laughs> no, no, no. Un Waco. Un Un Waco. Un Waco. A hollow space. A hollow. Right inside here, like like I lost something I never had, like I lost something I never had a chance at having. Un hueco, un hueco. Yeah, and, and I mean, I don't know. It's just, Grandma Esperanza always says, no seas quejona, which is kind of like, no crying over spilt milk. And she's right, no crying over what's already history. But still, sometimes, I still feel it in here, like something was stolen away. Yeah, I got class in here next. Yeah, any minute, as soon as this other class lets out, the guy quits talking, which I don't think he'll ever quit talking. Yeah, I got class in there, it's uh, introductory Spanish. <laughs> yeah, I'm learning Spanish. No, no use crying over spilt milk, but just because the bucket was spilled once doesn't mean you can't pour more milk in it. And that's what I'm doing. I'm learning Spanish. And this time, it won't get spilled. I was fed stereotypes. I was raised on stereotypes. I was crushed with stereotypes. I was taught stereotypes. I was slapped with stereotypes. I was suppressed with stereotypes. I was defined with stereotypes. You're Mexican. You don't look Mexican. <laughs> what do you mean? We don't all look alike. Oh, I know, but well, what do you mean? What should I look like? Well, short, dark, and speak English with a Spanish accent. Well, I'm short. That's one. How many do I need? Mm -hmm. My baby brother. He's dark, but he's six foot four. How many does he need? Nah. Stereotypes. Always oh, telling me what I should look like. My sh hair should be black. My eyes should be dark. My skin should be bronze. But we don't all look alike. We're all just a little different. And so I say, okay, you want a stereotype? You want to know who I am and what I am? I'll give you something. How about this? Is that more Mexican for you? <laughs> Does that work? Does that look better or worse? Tell me now. Do I look Mexican? They're always saying these things, and they mean them as compliments. That's the worst part. So, I, la poeta, decided that I would take those stereotypes, especially the language stereotypes, and I would put them all together in a little poem, a little rhyming, light, playful, something. And I decided I wouldn't just make it text mix, not just Spanish and English. I would mix in some French. Because you have to understand that in the US, we have a prestige ladder for our languages. Spanish means you're street, you're common, you're low. French means you're sophisticated and world traveled and very, very, very sexy. <laughs> English, if you speak in a British accent, everyone in the United States knows you're extremely well educated. <laughs> but if you speak with a French accent, you are sexy like Pepe Le Pew. Pepe Le Pew is a skunk, but he is sexy because he speaks French. <laughs> so I decided I would take those and I would blend them together not only blend them together, but I would do to the words what we do to the words in Spanish and English. Because there are concepts that exist in English that don't exist in Spanish, and concepts that exist in Spanish that don't exist in English, and that's why we speak Spanglish 
or to expect. It's because we come to a concept that doesn't exist and we say, I, I was having such a great day and then he did that and it filled me with asco. <laughs> asco. It gave me such asco because you can't say asco in English because asco is a nausea. Nausea is only physical. Disgust is, is too light. Asco is like you're about to throw up from the disgust and the nausea and everything else. It's much worse than either of those two. So people borrow it and use it in their English. Or they're speaking Spanish and they hear a concept like flunk. I'm going to flunk the class. Voy a flunkear. La teacher me va a flunkear. Or I miss the plane in Spanish. You don't miss the plane. Se me fue el avión, the plane of the left on me. So we have to say, Misti el avión. We have to invent the word. We have to hispanize the English word or anglicize the Spanish word. So in this poem, I gallicized the Spanish terms and hispanized the English terms and anglicized the French and the English and the Spanish terms. And we came up with a takeoff on the midnight ride of Paul Revere. Paul Revere, a great patriot in the United States. A little, little satirical uh, takeoff, although instead of a midnight ride, it's now the minuit chingade. And if you don't know what that means in French, it's okay, it's not a French word. It's a Spanish word, and it's a dirty word, and it's a heavy word, but it sounds so much nicer and more sophisticated in French, so. Let me be that. Listen, my children, and you shall see how the creme de la creme makes its reverie. A little Francais may nicely be misclaid to show one's noblesse and be sophisticated. A sign of finesse to chase away the bête noire d'être pas différent, except with pouvoir. But what a faux pas if you should sortie not into Francais but the Espanol de aquí. Some call it tex Meg, some call it enchilade, but one thing's for sure, no sirve para nade. <laughs> to mix Spanish in our English would be a pen de hate. They would replie without silvo play a la chingade. <laughs> so to be accepted by the aristocracy, bite your tongue, hold your words, or to put it more simply, ma chère chicanade, watch how you parlay. Pick le langue de prestige, avoid la minorité. And if you believe this, pauvre, pas de problème. Mais pour moi, I must confide any boy que tu la même. Every language has value. Da gusto l'ambiance. La langue, c'est moi. Et vive la différence. Mm -hmm. tonight you may find slightly familiar it is the voice of la conferencière oh. <laughs> <laughs> at some of the conferences in the US we get carried away we put little ribbons on here that say speaker <laughs> and if you're an author, you get a good speaker and author. And if you're a major conference presenter, you get speaker and author and conference presenter. Welcome to this 27th Annual Innovations and Social Innovation Conference. <laughs> Our central conference theme, Diversities Empowerment, I would like to elaborate with a correlate parallel, which is Diversity is authenticity. Authenticity, you may ask yourself, what is authenticity? Authenticity is the simple matter of being yourself. But being yourself is not always easy in a world that tells you that you should be young and thin and a certain color skin and a certain color eyes and a certain color hair. That you should speak a certain language, that you should have a certain income, that you should be like the model on the front of the Cosmopolitan magazine. Not real. Because most of the people in the world don't fit those perfect ideals. It's all great if you look like the model on the cover of the Cosmopolitan magazine after she's been airbrushed. <laughs> but what if you're short, dark, poor, over 40, and you don't fit the authenticity of the ideal. I tell people, be who you are. 
our power is inside us. All of our diversity, all of our uniqueness, it's in there. It's inside you, it's born into you. Even famous psychologists like James Hillman do studies of calling and find that identical twins with identical genes begin to vary when it comes to passion, when it comes to dreams, that something special, a soul, is born inside them that gives them their longing and their passion, totally unique from everyone else's. You have it inside you. You have that passion, you have that uniqueness, that thing that sets you apart. When I was a child, my dream was to be a writer. I didn't know any writers. There weren't any writers on my side of town. There weren't, I didn't even know the names of writers. There weren't even any libraries on my side of town. My side of town was the poor side of town. They didn't put libraries over there. They said, ah, those people don't even speak English. What do they need libraries for? And so we had no books. We had no libraries. I didn't know any writers, and I wanted to be a writer. Where did that come from? I don't know. I wanted to be a writer. So when I was 11, they put a book at the li uh, they put a library on my side of town, and I would check out five books once a week. My mother would walk me all the way to the library and back. And I would look, I would read the whole, all five books and I'd be done, and then I'd be bored. And I'd go back and I looked and I missed something. Was there something I didn't read? And yes, there is a boring page in every book. It's right behind the title page and it has little fine print. <laughs> and it says things like ISBN colon 0 916727 10 6 Wings Press, Doubleday, New York, Random House, New York. Little Brown, New York, I began to think that all books came from New York. Yeah. I began to think that if I wanted to be a writer, I had to write like the people wrote in those books and about the things that they wrote about, and I had to go to New York. So I tried. I tried to write my first novel. I was 11 years old. And it said one day, while walking through the middle of Central Park, <laughs> comma, in New York, comma, and that was it. I was stuck. That was the end of my first no. I had no idea what could happen in New York. I had never been to New York. I had never seen Central Park. I thought, too bad. If only I'd grown up in New York, I might have had something to write about. I have nothing to write about. I've never been to Central Park. We don't even have a park at the end of my block like they have on those fancy neighborhoods on TV. At the end of my block, instead of a park, they had a tortilleria. <laughs> A tortilla shop where an elderly woman would make corn tortillas for a penny each. And you would go up the steps past the screen door that said rainbow bread is good bread. They didn't have any rainbow bread, but it was a good screen door. <laughs> <laughs> and you would go in, and this old, old woman, the oldest person I had ever seen still breathing, would come up towards the counter. And she would get to the front counter. And the little kid from down the block would cut line in front of me and say, put seven pennies on the counter and say, siete tortillas, por favor. And she would start to count out those seven pennies because it was a penny per tortilla, no tax, no, nothing fancy. If you had 18 pennies, you bought 18 tortillas. And if you had seven pennies, you bought seven tortillas. It was very easy. And as she looked at those pennies and counted them off, I watched her go, oh, no. It was going to take a long while. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at her face, and her face was brown and wrinkled. It looked like the mud puddles in San Antonio in the summer when it hasn't rained for a long while and, and they're cracked and dry. These charcos are little brown squares of cake dirt. That's what her face looked like. It looked just like that. And I said, I know why she and the dirt look alike. She's the oldest breathing creature on the planet. She and the dirt are the same age. That's why they look alike. And then she said, tres. <laughs> and I looked at her hair. And the sunlight was coming in through the window. And her hair was so white that when the sunlight hit it, it looked like they were sending these rays back and forth, vibrations. They were communicating. 
they will say, hey, are you doing this since you okay? Last siglo tal in gacho, híjole. Oh man, too bad to hear that. You know, they're no. talking to each other. They were good buddies. And I said, I know why they're good buddies. They have the same birthday. She and the sun. She is the oldest breathing creature in the solar system, that's why. And then she kept on counting until finally she got to siete. And I looked at her hands. And her hands didn't look like they were made out of hands. They looked like they were made out of the corn masa that she'd been working all day long to make those tortillas. And I said, she's older than Mexican food. <laughs> no civilization would be possible anywhere in the universe without Mexican food. She must be the oldest breathing creature in the universe. That's what it is. And she counted off the seven pennies, put them in the pocket of her delantar, and turned around to yell to the back of the house because it was not a store like a store store. It was a house where they lived in the back and sold tortillas in the front. And she called for a little help, because when you're the oldest breathing creature in the universe, you deserve a little help. She turned around so slowly, up and it does, up and it does, and she yelled, Mama. <laughs> <laughs> me saying, yo no sé nada, man. I don't know anything. Like a lot of kids in the United States today who are Spanish speakers who speak two languages and master two cultures who say, no, man, not me. I don't have nothing to write about. I don't have nothing to talk about. I don't know anything, ma'am. I'm not smart. You mean him. You mean her. Not me, ma'am. I'm not special. I don't know nothing. And they really believe they don't. The years passed, and through one miracle and another, I became a writer. And at one point, I was asked to appear in the directory of Poets and Writers of America with Robert Frost and Carl Sandburg. And they make you list everything that was published everywhere, every time, in every language. And so I did. And I found out there was one piece that was published more than anything else. It wasn't about New York or Central Park or universal world issues or human struggles. It was a little tiny 10-line poem about the world's oldest woman <laughs> and her mother at a tortilla. Mm -hmm. Now, why was that poem successful? Was it because if you want to be a writer, you either have to grow up in New York or in a block with a tortilla at the end of it? <laughs> no. It was because it came from who I authentically was. And your best, your brightest, your most creative, your most dynamic, your most amazing, your most innovative comes from being who you really are. What it is inside you that makes you different with all the enhancements that education adds to it. You are still that unique person with a unique calling. So from that unique stance, I'd like to close this 27th Annual Innovations in <laughs> Innovation Conference with a poem, which is a mother's poem. Because sometimes it is those who are humblest among us, those who are serving among us, those who are working at the lowest levels of society who give the most, the parents, who might be working two jobs, who might be working without papers, who might be working in the back kitchens and then coming home and working at home again to feed their children. It is they who give us the next generation because they are giving us survival for our children for the next generation. This is called feeding you about the simple act of nurturance. And it uses a few Spanish words in there some of them you'll know, some you won't. The ones you have to know are mijo and mija. And if you've never been called mijo or mija, you have now been called mijo or mija. 
It means my son, my daughter. It's a form of being kind and caring and nurturing to another. It's not just used on a child, it's used on other people. And she uses this term, mijo, mija, mijos. And the other term you need to know is herencia, which means heritage, because language is part of our heritage. Language is not stiff and unchanging. Language is dynamic. Language is always moving. But even in its movement, it carries forward the seed of its inheritance. So feeding you. Dear mijo, dear mija, I have slipped chile under your skin, mm -hmm. secretly wrapped in each enchilada, hot and soothing, carefully cut into bitefuls for you as a toddler, increasing in power and intensity as you grew until it could burn forever. Silently spiced into the rice, soaked into the bean caldo, smoothed into the avocado, I have slipped chile under your skin, drop by fiery drop, until it ignited the sun altar fire in your blood. I have squeezed cilantro into the breast milk, made sure you were nurtured with the taste of green life and corn stalks, with the wildness of leaves, of untamed monte, of unscheduled growth. I have ground the earth of these Americas in my moncajete and sprinkled it surely into each spoonful of food that would have to expand to fit your soul. Dear mijos, dear mijos, dear corn, chile, cilantro, mijos, this is your herencia. This is what is yours. This is what your mother fed you to keep you 